the heart, the heart of what we're looking at this morning, it kind of goes back to something that we saw in John chapter 2. An event that we saw in John chapter 2 where we saw Jesus and he was just filled with zeal for his father's house. The fa- his father's house, the, the temple of God, was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, a house of prayer for all people. But it was a place where the religious authorities of the day, where they didn't value all people. They only valued some people. They only valued their little group, the group that they deemed as the chosen people. And thus, they thought that it was good and acceptable to allow money changers into the court of the Gentiles, that place where the Gentiles would come to worship, where people from all over the world would come to worship, they figured, you know, let's just leave that for the money changers and for those that sell animals, because after all, it's the chosen people that's the priority. And Jesus was moved by this hypocrisy. He was moved by the shadow that their actions and their allowances were casting upon God. See, people were learning about God, but they were learning wrong. And what they were learning about God was what these religious people were, you know, declaring him to be. And by their practices, what... They declared God to be is the God who cared for that small group of chosen people, but had complete disregard for all the rest. And Jesus, in his zeal, took a made a a whip of cords and he drove those hypocrites out. The very next chapter is where we see Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night. And Nicodemus was a highly religious man. He was a man with all of his misconceptions about God and part of a system that assumed that they were the special ones and everyone else was basically destined for hell. And since that was the case, in their minds, if we're the, if we're the special ones and everyone else is destined to hell, then why care? But to him and his whole religious system, Jesus addresses them in their self-superiority and says, hey, you must be born again. And as we finished out our time last week, just discussing that mind-blowing, everlasting love of God, we also saw the simplicity of what it actually takes to be saved. To be born again. Now, is there technicalities and complexities and even just like mind-blowing mysteries to the redemption that we have in Christ? Absolutely. And in fact, like sometimes we explore those things just because it captivates our hearts and minds in wonder. But the depths of the riches of the knowledge of God like, that's with God. It's like this treasure chest that we, we search out. But the simplicity by which we receive this deep, um, th- this depth that's unsearchable is so, so beautifully simple. Jesus says in John 3, verse 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Remember, the question of Nicodemus was, how can these things be? And Jesus answers, oh, how can you be born again? How can you be saved? As simply as when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. When Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, it was when the Israelites were traveling there in the wilderness, and in their discouragement, they began to murmur against the Lord. And remember, we referred to the passage of Numbers 21, verses 6 through 9, 
So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And so we have the eternal God who has forever had you on his mind, how he came down from heaven, and yet as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, how Jesus was lifted up on the cross. And if you would look to him, if you would simply believe that trusting in him can save you, the declaration here is you would not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, there were serpents in the wilderness that were biting people, but there was before that, there was a serpent in the garden. And the serpent in the garden that tempted Adam and Eve to sin against God. And from that moment, sin spread to us all. That there was something that died within us that day. That capacity of having that personal relationship with God. And that if we would just look to Jesus, that we would be saved. Now, in this conversation, Jesus is presenting these two very different ways of life. Could you imagine there that day in the wilderness as the snakes are biting people? And there's the remedy lifted up on a pole in the wilderness. And all men and women had to do to be rescued from death is to look to the serpent that was lifted up on a pole and they would be saved. Could you imagine the, the, the shame of those who died in the wilderness because they refused to look to that, that one that was lifted up? And so now Christ is presenting to us these two radically different ways of life. On the one hand, there's a belief, a belief that results in rescue and truly living, like eternal life, everlasting life, life and life more abundantly. And on the other hand, and that's just that's life now and forever, but on the other hand, there is a disobedience, a refusal of the good way that God has provided. It's a rejection that will ultimately result in living under the wrath of God both now and forever. So there's a problem with us problem with life and that basic problem is like why is it that like have you noticed that doing wrong just seems to be so easy doing wrong is so easy and yet doing the right thing and living the right way it seems to be so hard where doing wrong is easy and doing right is hard and then people begin to question the goodness of God like, why did he make it so hard to do good and to be good, and yet it's so easy to be bad? Why did God make it that way? And then on top of that, then why would God punish us for something that he made so hard? Like, what, what kind of mean and cruel God is that? That this God would make doing right so hard, and then he'd punish us for not doing what he made so difficult in the first place. Now, let me just say a little, like, side note. It's not God's fault, by the way, that you and I have this, like, magnetic draw within us towards sin. I mean, that goes back to not the serpent in the wilderness, but the serpent in the garden. And from the time that Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God, and sin and death passed upon us all. And now the Bible declares, like in Romans, that like death itself reigns over us. Like we almost become like the subjects and servants 
of this separation. But that's a whole other study. Um, I'm just talking about the way people would begin to think about God because of, you know, making these deductions. But if you look at that, that idea of like, why would God make doing good so hard and yet doing bad so easy, and then he would judge us for not doing what's good? Wow, that sounds cruel. Or even to some, they would say, why would God make it to where it's impossible for us to do good and then still condemn us and judge us for not doing what he made impossible? That sounds cruel. But look here in in John 3. We're not speaking of some cruel God. We're not talking about a God who makes it impossible to live for him and then condemns us for the way that he made us. We're not talking about some distant God who doesn't have concern for people. We aren't talking about some God who only has concern for a small group of people and then has disregard for the rest. That's not the kind of God that John 3.16 speaks of. And that probably that's why it's such a such an important and foundational verse for us in our concept of who God is. Like if your concept of God is challenged by John 3.16, good. Let your concept of God be absolutely shook by John 3.16. Because this is the way that God has manifested himself blatantly and clearly in Christ. John 3.16 tells us this. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at that. It's so simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 doesn't describe some hard, cruel God who is completely indifferent to our situation. He doesn't describe a God who is untouched by our sufferings. John 3.16 speaks of a God who, looking upon the sea of humanity, it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Like when God looks at our world, yeah, of course, he sees the sin. He sees like all of the hatred and bitterness and anger and the greediness and the way that it's just so self-destructive. He sees all of that. But you know what he also sees is he sees the pain. He sees the tears. He sees the depression. He sees the, and this one blows my mind, the feeling of meaninglessness. Like, we are created in the image of God. From the time you wake up in the morning, like this morning when I woke up, I was hearing chickens out my window. And then I started listening further, and I'd be like, wow, there's, I hear the chickens that are close to me, and then I hear chickens that are further. And then I just started focusing on just the sound of chickens, and I was like, man, the entire island sounds just like there's chickens just screaming their heads off. Just like, there, you know, there's the ones up close, but it eventually it kind of just goes into this, you know. And uh, the other night we were with the kids and we, we watched um, Peter Rabbit 2. And there's this scene of this, these chickens that they're standing there on the fence. And they're like, the, the, the one rooster is like, wake up, wake up. We have to bring the great burning ball of, of fire up over the mountains or the world will perish. And so the chicken's like, oh, like they're all trying to wake up the sun. It was like a funny portrayal. 
But you know, it's just so beautiful when you see the, the joy that's portrayed in birds. Like when you see birds and they're just singing, they got their songs. I don't think the birds wake up like, life is meaningless. They know their place. They know their purpose. And they just seem to be having a great time right there in the middle of it all. And yet here we are created in the image of God. Like, a mind-blowing point that I, I, just, I was just reading it on Friday, that it says that man is the glory of Christ. Like, what? In, in 1 Corinthians 11, that man is the glory of Christ? To think that the glory of God's creation the pinnacle of God's creation, so precious in the eyes of our creator, and yet we walk around feeling like life is meaningless? What a tragedy. God sees that all of the sin and the hatred and the murder and the pain and the depression and the meaninglessness the futility of it all. He sees that when he sees all of this and that we are the cause of the agony that we feel because we continually try to be the answer to our own problems, the rescue to our own situation, and we just keep digging a deeper and deeper hole for ourselves. When God sees this, like his reaction isn't anger. According to what we just saw there, what's God's reaction when he looks upon the sea of humanity? It's this. It's for God so loved the world. We see this exemplified in the life of Christ. It tells us in Matthew 9, 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. God is moved with love. For God so loved the world. Love for the whole world. Not like Nicodemus and his th thinking. Not like the Jews thinking of how they're like, okay, well, the court of the Gentiles, that's not very significant. We can use that for money changing and for selling animals because they're not the chosen people. They're the outsiders. We're the chosen ones. So therefore, like, we're the important ones in the scenario. And we saw how that moved Jesus to action. He's not just moved with compassion for this group or that group. God's love and compassion goes out to all. That's what this verse declares. For God so loved the world. All the way back to like the pronouncement by the angels to the shepherds there in the field by night. In Luke 2, verse 8 through 10, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. There's shepherds in the fields by night getting this revelation of who God is, who his heart is towards. Do not be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy for all people. So even his birth, who did he come for? For all people. From his birth to his agony on the cross, for God so loved the world. Hebrews 2.9 but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, 
might taste death for everyone. Uh, after first service, a question was raised about this particular verse. And, and the way the author structures it is he talks about this high and exalted position that God's given to man. Dominion that God gave to man in the Garden of Eden, but dominion that man lost when he forfeited it to Satan. And then from that, Psalm 8 mentions it, and then Hebrews 2 mentions it. And he talks about, like, what is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you'd visit him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You put all things in subjection under his feet, all beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, and all that passes through the paths of the sea. You, go, you put all things in subjection under him. And then the author of Hebrews says, but we don't see all things put under him. We don't see that. We don't see that because man forfeited that. They, man gave it up. Where we're supposed to be reigning in, at life by the one, Christ Jesus, where we're supposed to be reigning in life, there's people that are absolute slaves to a simple sugar. Alcohol. Alcohol is just a type of sugar. And it's ruining lives, wrecking lives, ruling over people's lives. They're a complete slave to it. A little sugar rules your life. You're supposed to be ruling in life. We don't see all things put under him, but then the author says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. John tells us in 1 John 2, 2, for he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And that little word there in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, it's an important word because it shows the extent of this love. It's the greatest extent God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that word gave, it doesn't just speak of the incarnation, which is a beautiful thing to remember right now that, you know, here we are, we're in the Christmas season and to remember the love of God. But it doesn't just speak of the incarnation. It also speaks of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus. Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a demonstration of love. God seeing our grief, God seeing our sorrow, and wanting to do something specifically about our grief and our sorrow, he endured the cross. It tells us in Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. For God so loved the world and it took agony and it took blood and death and darkness and unspeakable shame. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For me, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And to think that he took our place. And through his death, he made a way out. And that's why this is the gospel. I think of the old Christian rap song. It says, um, your birth, you hurt, then the hearse. That's the curse. <laughs> but there's a loophole. <laughs> and I love that, you know, like that, that's, that's the progression, right? You birth, you hurt, then your hearse. And that's the curse. <laughs> but there's a loophole. And this is the loophole. That God seeing our situation, God seeing our sin, 
our transgressions and our iniquities. And he bore them in his body on the tree. God, seeing our griefs and our sorrows and him bearing them on his body on the tree. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Our healing. He took our place. Uh, Charles Wesley, uh, as this, this hymn came up on Friday, I was meeting with a couple, and this hymn is so powerful. The lyrics from Charles Wesley's, And Can It Be? It says, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me to whom, uh, for me who him to death pursued. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And that's the heart of John 3.16. That God's arms are open and he's ready to receive. And we can come to him. Just as we are. We come looking to the one who was lifted up. We come believing. Like the story of the prodigal son after the son had, remember he had wasted all of his father's inheritance. And while he's there trying to eat pig's food, he starts thinking back to what it was like in his father's house. He remembered his father's kindness to his own servants how they have plenty to eat. And then he began to rehearse what he was going to say to his father. He's like, I'm going to go back. I'll go back to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just let me be your servant. So he has this whole speech planned on what he's going to say and how he's going to like denounce his right to even be part of the family. And he's just going to beg for a job. And Luke 15, 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. <laughs> he didn't even get to rehearse his speech. His whole thing about how I've sinned against heaven and against you and I'm no longer worthy. Like he didn't even get to say any of that. The father saw him afar off and came running to him, fell on his neck and kissed him. The father in the story of the prodigal son is a picture of how God receives those who've strayed. What a welcome. Right? For God so loved the world. <laughs> and can't forget the next verse. John 3.17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This verse, it's, it actually gives us kind of a, a good rule of thumb on how we should go to communicate the gospel to the world around us. Like, if God was going to send you to communicate the gospel, how's he going to do it? He's probably going to send you in a similar way that he sent his son. Not to die for their sins, but to certainly point to the one who came to die for the sins of the world. Now, watch this. When God sent his son to the world, it says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. So our evangelism should be more like Jesus's. It shouldn't be going into the world and be like, ha ha, you wicked, vile individual. God sees how dirty you are and how hot your hell will be. Praise Jesus. <laughs> like our message isn't one of condemnation. 
Even to the shepherds in the field that night, they knew it was glad tidings of great joy for all people. We shouldn't be shaking our finger at them and pointing out how terrible they are and all the evil things that you are doing to yourself. It would be better if we came to them sensing their agony and their hurt their inward sense of shame, the loneliness and misery and anguish that they're going through, all of the things that their sin has brought into their life and is wreaking havoc. I love the way Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians. That is, in 2 Corinthians 5.19, I have it in the ESV here. That is, In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation, not the message of condemnation. A message of reconciliation. And that's how we see Jesus ministering in the Gospels. Right? They even brought accusation against him like he is a friend of sinners. He finds himself hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, with the lowly and dirty ones. When he's dealing with open, blatant sinners, you don't even see him bringing a word of condemnation. You know who he brings the the blazing words of condemnation to? Is the religious leaders who think that they're the special righteous ones and all the other ones are the dirty ones. He, He blasts them a bit. But like the woman caught in adultery. Remember, the like... Jesus said, well, okay, let let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. They wanted Jesus to throw rocks at her till she was dead, caught in adultery. Jesus, throw rocks at her till she dies. Okay, okay, let, let him who's without sin among you cast the first stone. So there's only one worthy one there. There's only one who meets the job classification and qualifications. Uh, it's It's Jesus. But instead, he just begins to write on the, the sand. And we'll, we'll get into this when we get to John 8. But it says, they all began to leave from the oldest to the youngest. And then, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus is courteous. He doesn't attack her or blame her. or He says, nor do I condemn you. Now, let, let, let me just clarify something, though. That doesn't mean that God is, like, suddenly, like, well, you know, like, God's okay with your sin. Like, he accepts your sin. No. Everywhere in Scripture, like, if you read your Bible at all, you're going to find out that Jesus didn't come so that you can be okay with your sin. He came to set you free from your sin, the penalty of your sin, Uh, the power of your sin, and finally one day the presence of sin altogether. And I praise God for that rescue, right? But, But salvation is the rescue from the penalty of sin. And then the sanctification, that process of of leaving your sin, of trusting the power of the Holy Spirit to have victory over sin, not to twist the message so that it makes it seem like God's okay with sin. That's something God will never be okay with. God cares about you. He doesn't want you to continue to invest your life in the things that are destroying you. That's why he told the woman, go and sin no more. Jesus came to free us from our sins, not to leave us in them. But you got to understand this. It's not your sins that's keeping you from coming to him.
Because his heart is open. He has extended the invitation. He has declared it so plainly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God has removed the condemnation and made it possible to come freely, openly home to him. But that still leaves a choice. Jesus speaks of that in verse 18 and following. It says, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. What is the condemnation? This is the condemnation that they won't come to the light. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He didn't need to condemn you. He didn't come to condemn the world. The world is already condemned. But the issue is, it's not so much the list of wrongs that you've done. You will be held accountable for every wicked deed done in the body. But that's like... That's not the big issue. The big issue is simply your faith in or your rejection of the only provision that God has made for you. It's as simple as that. The only way for you to have forgiveness of sins. That is why Jesus, he said, when the Holy Spirit has come in John 16, 8 and 9, When he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. When the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, it's this specifically, that they do not believe in me. And that's the only sin that's going to damn your soul. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world God laid upon him the iniquity of us all, and his death satisfied completely the wrath of God for you and all of humanity. There's only one charge and indictment that God's going to make against anyone, and that's that failure to come to the light, the failure to receive God's provision like 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation, not for our sins only. That propitiation is the appeasement of wrath. That he is the propitiation, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But the condemnation is this. Because he has not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. I like the verse there in Joshua 30, verse 19, where it just says, I call heaven and earth to witness today against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. The gospel is so simple. In closing, I'm going to wrap it up with this story. Um, I was in Mexico in a little village in Baja, California, uh, 
sharing the gospel with this little village. You know, we have our border crisis, and there's all these like illegal immigrants that are that are funneling into our country. There's this perception throughout the entire world, even. I, I knew a guy that I met in South Africa that he was from Congo, and Congo was so violent that he wouldn't go back to Congo. So he found his way from South Africa somewhere up, you know, up in northern Africa, got on a plane, and then flew to Mexico and crossed the Texas border because it was easier for him to to fly all the way. No, he flew. He didn't fly to Mexico. He flew to Brazil. And then from Brazil, he went all the way up and then crossed illegally into the Texas border. And like, I can't go back to the Congo. They'll kill me there. And then he got a hold of me and he's like, hey, uh, can you send me some like soap and toothpaste? I'm, I'm in a facility in Texas. <laughs> How'd you get there? Well, I just tried to smuggle myself into the country. All right. That was a couple years ago. But, but the attitude throughout all of the world is if you can just cross the wall, you're going to get taken care of. And so what that does is it creates this, like, this massive um, amount of these people that have left their homes and then they get close to the border and they realize that it's tough to just get across. And so then they kind of set up these little, little villages. They're just temporary. But in the middle of those situations, the living conditions is terrible. You know, the, like the sickness, the disease that will spread through these little encampments. The children, the situation that these children are in, it's so bad. And so, you know, it, they're not hard to find. And we had kind of adopted this one, just trying to care for these people, giving, like bringing tarps so they can cover their, like their little shacks so they'd stay dry in the rain and bring them warm clothing. And as we were having this, this time, then it was my time to present the gospel. And I had my friend, his name's Mario, and he was my interpreter. And I'm sharing the gospel with these people. And I got down to the point where it was like the main point of my gospel presentation. And it was this on John 3.16, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And my like final point, I'm like building it to this, was this. Can it really be that simple? And then my interpreter begins to speak. And I don't, I can't speak a lot of Spanish, but I can understand a lot more than what I can speak. And so I start listening to him go, and I'm like, my main point was, can it really be that simple? But he starts going. <laughs> and it's just like, and he gets going, and he's like really into it. I'm like, okay, he's well over said what I just told him to say. Like, that's not what I'm saying. In fact, some of these words that I'm hearing him say, that has nothing to do with what I'm saying. This guy's on his own roll. He's not sharing what I'm trying to get him to say. And at that point, I was like, oh, hold on, hold on. I think, I, I think the word is, espérate, espérate. Right. Is that right? Is that right? I don't know. Anyway, and I'm like, Mario, I told you to tell them, can it really be that simple? That's not what you said, right? Like, no. You tell them that I told you to say, can it really be that simple? And then you went on and started saying all this other stuff. Tell them that. So then I hear he's saying, and he starts explaining. What he wanted to get to was to say, can it really be that simple? And then I went on and I said all of this extra stuff. I said, OK, now let's get back to it. And then right there, I used Mario as an illustration <laughs> of how God has presented this plan of salvation to you. And it is so simple. It's simply that you would place your faith on the one who was lifted up, who bore in his body on the tree your grief, your sorrow, your sin, that you would simply believe in him. And yet, my friend here, meaning well, 
took that simple message and made it way more than what I had intended. And this morning, I just want to encourage you, like, don't let the simplicity of all of this get lost in the translation. So often, like, God's people meaning well, we cast this shade on what the gospel actually is. We give these impressions of who God is and what his heart is towards people. But the heart of the gospel is simply put your faith in Christ. Because he has accomplished what you could never accomplish. And he did it on your behalf. Simply place your faith in Jesus.